Suki Hontu again, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Welcome to our online Breaking the Myth series. Today, we are already running into the 22nd series titled What I Want is Broken. Sekian E. Melaka is the host for tonight's talk, and I am Brother Danny. As a matter of fact, our speaker tonight, Dr. Punya Wong, had been invited quite a number of times to give Dhamma talk at Sekian in Malacca. Dr. Punya Wong is a popular Dhamma speaker among our Buddhist circle. Therefore, he need no further introduction. Let us invite Dr. Punya Wong to share the Dhamma. But before that, I would like to recite Pantun. Buah Durian Kulitnya Beduri banyak biji isi buah delima. Kini saya menyusun sepuluh jari menjemput Dr. Punya berkongsi dhamma. Silakan. Thank you, Brother Danny. I'm afraid I have no reply to a beautiful pantun like that. That is way beyond me. And Namo Buddhaya to the Dhamma family in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the rest of the world. We are very happy that we have viewers from all over the world now, and some of them have to be at unearthly hours to watch this sharing. So thank you so much, and welcome Namo Buddhaya again. Let me share my screen. All right, brothers and sisters in the family. Today, as Brother Danny pointed out, is the 22nd of the series. The entire series is 25 talks. And this is coming to the end of this series. But because we have such a wonderful audience, about 4,000 people view our sharing every Friday night, we have made a collective decision that even when this 25 series is over, we will take a break and then we will resume with another series based on my first book, Walking in the Buddha's Footsteps. So please um, watch out for it. The posters and the notices will be there. But tonight, our sharing is on what I want is broken. And this is a common scenario. If you look at this cartoon peanuts, Charlie Brown is asking Linus, do you think much about life? And of course he says, yes, all the time. What do you want to be when you grow up? And Linus replied, outrageously happy. Now, that is what all of us wish to have. Whatever our social status, background, age, gender, everyone wants happiness and dislike suffering. In fact, life is an endless pursuit of happiness. Just look back into your own life, my own life, and you will see that we are endlessly seeking happiness. Whether mundane happiness from the gratifications of our senses or supramundane happiness from contentment, knowledge, wisdom, and finally, the end of suffering. But as we walk this path, as we pursue the Buddha's teachings, we should be having more and more happiness as we let go of more and more dukkha. Nevertheless, until the day you are fully awakened, we will still experience suffering because that is the first noble truth. And we will be caught 
in the sway of disturbing emotions. And the Buddha's teachings, even before we become enlightened or awakened, teaches us how to handle these suffering and how to be not caught in the sway of disturbing emotions. Now, I love this story. It's such a profound story. And if you do not understand it, it doesn't make sense at all. But a Chan master, Chan is Chinese for jhana, a meditation master, was given a hand fan made from the horn of rhinoceros by the governor of the district. Surely this is very precious, very delicate, but he did not make much of it and casually put it in his room. On a particularly hot day, he needed a fan. And so he asked his attendant to please bring this fan from my room. The young man went to the room and to his horror came back reporting that the fan is smashed, smashed by the weight of books that had been placed on it. Well, the master said, in that case, he said in reply to his young attendant, bring me the rhinoceros. Another student observing this conversation had an awakening. And this is represented by this little image we see here of a monk sitting on top of a rhinoceros. Sister from Subhanjaya Liming is still looking for such an image. So what does this conversation, which seemingly sound nonsensical, teach us? Yes, in hot weather, a fan is valuable and precious. And in the hot weather, like what we experience in Malaysia or in the summer of temperate countries, a fan is indispensable. To most people, the happiness depends on that fan relieving the heat. And we are all like that. Our happiness depends on a lot of things without which we become despondent. But in this situation, the precious fan is broken. To most of us, that would be unhappiness. But the, Zan, the Chan master said, bring me the rhinoceros. And this is not only illogical, but impossible too, as the rhinoceros is not indigenous to China. And in fact, if possible, it would be dangerous. So what does this mean? What is he trying to tell? What is he trying to teach his attendants? Now Chan training requires that we each see this story reflect upon it, and then come to an aha moment, a conceptual breakthrough, where we see the lesson behind the story. The master had asked for the impossible, compassionately teaching us that our happiness need not depend on the conditions that we had set. To all of us, the condition at that point for happiness is a fan cooling us down by its breeze. But the master had asked for the impossible, and in this he is compassionately teaching him and all his students that our happiness need not depend on these conditions that we had preset. And many times in life, what we had preset is impossible, just like in this broken fan. So asking for the rhinoceros represents accepting the impossible, living with the worst case scenario, no fan, no relief from the heat, the rhinoceros in the room, a situation whereby most of us will find unacceptable and unhappy. And yet the Chan master said, we can live well, contented and happy, even within that context. So often my wife and I will use this expression whenever we have something which disappoints us or something which would appear to be causing unhappiness, then we will say, bring me the rhinoceros, which means, yes, it is the worst, but we can still be happy. 
because our situation need not dictate our emotional state of mind. So this requires a paradigm shift in attitude and thinking. For to most of us, if not all of us, our happiness is dependent on what we have to be happy. In this context, people want to have a fan in modern times, an aircon to be happy. But if you can be happy, even when you do not have, and even in difficult situations, then you have truly mastered your emotions. And we may now understand why to many people, the historical Chan masters appear a bit odd and possibly even mad as their approach to life radically differs from the general populace. So our emotions, whether happy, sad, angry, all arise within ourselves because of cause, condition, and effect. But when you look at your own mind, you can realize that these emotions need not be me or my emotion unless I allow it to be. So the classical text is very short. It's just a few lines as in most Chan stories. But here what is the lesson is that within what we learn from the Buddha Dharma is that it employs our human intelligence in dealing with our disturbing emotions. And I often use this phrase, we train our rational mind to be the dominant force instead of the emotional mind. For the untrained person, his emotional mind or her emotional mind becomes the decision maker. And that's why so many of our decisions, right or wrong, are made because of emotions. It is rare that you will find a person who makes his decision not because of emotion, but because of logical, rational analysis. If you understand Chinese, you will see these two lines. Fo zai xin zhong, xin zhong yu fo. This is one of the very first things I learned when I embarked on my journey in the Buddha Dharma. And after so many decades, this is still one of the most profound teachings that I have learned and which I want to share with you all. Because these two lines, just eight words, fundamentally tell us the huge difference between the Buddha Dharma and all other religions. The first line, Fo Tai Sin Zhong. This was the late Chief Venerable's last Dharma talk before he passed away. Where is the Buddha? He asked. To many people, the Buddha may be something out there, someone out there, but that is merely the entrance to the Buddha Dharma. And as you learn more, you realize the Buddha is not somewhere out there, somewhere in some sphere. No, the Buddha is in your mind. And this first line already tells you that for Tai Sin Chong, the Buddha is not outside, not on your altar, not in Sakya Inn, not in Buddha Gaya, but in your own mind. And that already completely makes us different from all other religions who worship an external being, an external force. In other religions, they take refuge in an external force, hoping that that external force will save them, bail them out. But in the Buddha Dharma, we take refuge not in an external force, but in our wisdom, in our logical, rational mind because the Buddha is in your mind. The second line is also a line which teaches us what is fundamentally different between the Buddha Dharma and all other religions. Sin Chong Hyo Fo. Within you is that Buddha nature, that potential. 
Other religions may tell you, Brother Danny, you've got original sin. And unless that original sin is forgiven, you will burn in hell. Within the Buddha Dharma, there is no original sin. There is only original stupidity in that we are ignorant of the realities of life. There is no need to seek forgiveness because there is no one to forgive and none to be forgiven. What is being taught instead is within you and me and every one of us is that potential to be awakened, to evolve to be a noble person, a superior spiritual being. That's why sin chung in your mind, sin here doesn't refer to heart, but to your mind. You have that potential to be awakened. So instead of starting with a negative point that you are a sinner, you have got original sin, you are bad, destined to eat the dust of the earth. No, the Buddha Dharma begins the other way around, that you have all that potential to be wonderfully good. That's why these two lines are so important that I actually made this t-shirt and gave it to all my close friends to remind them the wonderful teaching of the Buddha Dharma. So all that we do originates in the mind or our actions. And if you have a good heart, a good mind, whatever, wherever, whenever you are, with proper motivation, your activities will be wholesome and helpful. Now, of course, all of us have to work and earn a living. And in the era of COVID-19, this becomes even more stressful as a lot of people have pay cut and a lot of people have lost their jobs. Now, many people among us actually see our boss, our employer, more than we see our spouse. Now, of course, if you work from home, you may see your spouse more. But when you're working from the office, you spend eight to 10 hours a day looking at your bosses. We you spend more time and energy dealing with difficult co-workers than we actually do with our own children. So work has become our personal identity, accomplishment to find purpose and meaning in life. Now, do you realize that within the Buddha Dharma, all work is spiritual practice. Every little bit of thing that you do in work is spiritual practice. Not just what you do at a meditation center or a temple or a Buddhist society, but everything that you do, that has a spiritual work. And it does not matter what your occupation is. It's only whether it is wholesome, unwholesome, and the effort and the dedication and your attitude to this work, that is important. And here at the corner, I shared a time story which I've shared so many times. Again, in the actual text, if you read, it is very brief, but the lesson is so profound. This is a monk who have trained for many years and traveled across mountains and valleys looking for masters to teach him another new secret, another new technique. And he heard that Zhao Zhou is a very eminent master. So he traveled far and near and reached Zhao Zhou's humble monastery. And he asked the venerable abbot Zhao Zhou, I have just entered the monastery. Please give me some guidance. And the abbot Zhao Zhou asked him, have you eaten your rice gruel, i.e. your porridge? And the monk replied, yes, I have eaten. And Tao Zhou said, then go wash your bowl. And with that, the monk had an awakening. Typical of Tan, it is just only these few lines that are in it. And Brother Danny now has to go into retreat and meditate on this for three months and come back and tell me the lesson he has learned. But this is again such a profound lesson. It took me years before I could understand what it means. Reading Ang Mo books didn't help because they didn't understand. Now, almost all of us are like this monk. 
We travel from center to center when the interstate thing is open, meditation center to meditation center, master to master, asking to be taught. Maybe there's a secret in the Mahasi method. Maybe there's a secret in the Sunlun method. Maybe this venerable knows a secret. Frankly, none of them have any secrets. And we have learned a lot. We have read a lot. Some even have the entire Tipitaka in their computer. We have all sipaula. We have all eaten the Dhamma to the neck. This is a play of Cantonese words. You have already eaten to the full. And that's why Zhao Zhou asked the monk, have you eaten? And the monk replied, yes, I have eaten. And Zhao Zhou replied, then go wash your bowl. Apply the Dhamma in your daily life, in everything that you do, from something so mundane as washing a bowl, all the way to being a cardiothoracic surgeon or a structural engineer. Apply the Dhamma. You have learned enough theory. Go wash your bowl. And among my friends in JB, we often tease each other when we go eat food. Nitsubama, and then they reply, Tsubalo, Chi Si Wan, which is in the original text. Just that few lines. But we know what we each mean. And then we have a good laugh and say, yes, we must practice the Dhamma. I hope these two lessons sink well into our consciousness. But they are very profound lessons. So work is where we face the fundamental truths of life. Much of life is frustrating. Everything is interconnected, impermanent, etc. And any one of us who have worked will know how true this harsh reality is, no matter what occupation you are in. You are an engineer, you've got engineering stress. You are a doctor, you've got doctor stress. You are a typist, you've got typist stress. You are a computer programmer, you've got computer programmer stress. Why? This Dhamma family is the first noble truth. The Buddha told us right at the very beginning, this is life. Not whether you like it or you don't like it. It is the first noble truth, the common denominator of life, that much of it, because of its nature of being impermanent, non-self is going to be frustrating. So let us realize something. We cannot solve the problems of the world. You and I cannot unblock that ship that is blocking the Swiss Canal right now. But you and I can start with ourselves. We can start by helping ourselves to train our mind. So the Buddha's teachings are above all practical. First, it is not about some reward in the sky. Please throw that out of your mind. Heaven and earth is created by our minds right on earth itself. It is about here and now. You want to see hell? Go to a dialysis center. You will see hell there. You want to see heaven? Look at someone falling in love. So happy. It is not about theory. It is not just a way of thinking. It is about what we can do to make our lives happier at every moment. So as I mentioned, the Buddha exists in every one of us. We call it, for lack of a better word, the Buddha nature. And all the times when we are mindful, when we make decisions based on logic and rationality, metta, karuna, we are awake. When we are acting based on greed, hatred, delusion, no more metta, no more karuna, that is when the Buddha nature in us is asleep, covered over by layers of defilement. But we can still sweep all that defilements away and make the Buddha awake within us. And every time you do that, it becomes your hobby, your habit, and sooner or later, your way of life and your personality. 
So mindfulness is something you are all familiar with. Being aware, being careful, being conscious of what we are doing. And when we are thinking, use the logical mind, not the emotional mind, not to act automatically, reacting by reflex or by condition, but to respond appropriately. And a person who can do this is a person who has right effort, right mindfulness, and the right stillness, the right state of calmness in his mind, not to react with knee-jerk reactions. You see two pictures that my good Dhamma brothers have used to promote today's sharing. They have used two pictures. One picture of a much younger me, which they jokingly say is the result of my COVID-19 vaccination, and another picture at the bottom of how I look like at present. So if you look at these two pictures, what you can have is two possible reactions. The first reaction, I yo, why am I so old and born? That's an old man at the lower picture, balding, no hair, white hair, etc. Versus, wow, I'm so grateful to live so well till this age. You know, how many people can live till this age and have such happy life? So, wow, I'm so happy and so grateful to actually have the opportunity to look like that in the lower picture. So what has happened? It is a change in attitude, a change of perspective. And someone may actually ask, hey, Brother Buddha, did the Buddha really teach this man or you make it up yourself? No, absolutely the Buddha taught this. And my name, was given to me, Puna, because of this. I suppose the teacher wanted me to have a change in attitude, a change in perception, and to teach, because Puna was a good teacher documented in the Nikayas as the Puna Sutta. I've taken an extract from here. The Venerable Puna went to see the Buddha and asked the Buddha to give him an instruction in brief. That you see is a standard line because in those days, they hardly have the opportunity to see the Buddha. The Buddha is always moving. And so when they have the opportunity, they will ask, can you please teach me in brief the Dhamma? After which, let me go, contemplate, reflect, meditate, think. And then I will use this teaching well. And the Buddha had taught the Venerable Puna. And now he said, well then, Puna, now that I've instructed you, in which country are you going to live? Because he's going to travel now in turn to teach. And when Arupuna say, Lord, there is a country called Suna Paranta. I'm going to live there. And the Buddha said, Puna, the Suna Paranta people are fierce. They are rough. If they insult and ridicule you, how will you think? Now, I used to teach before the COVID-19 lockdown in Singapore very regularly. And I used to tease my Singapore Dhamma family that maybe Suna Paranta is actually Singapura. And of course, we all have a good laugh, okay? But here in this record, the people at Suna Paranta are apparently very fierce people. And so the Buddha is asking Puna, of all the places, why do you choose to go there? What if they insult you, ridicule you? Because you're trying to go and teach them. What will you do? And the Venerable Puna replied, if they insult and ridicule me, I will think these Suna Paranta people are civilized, very civilized, in that they don't hit me with their hands. That is what I will think, oh, blessed one. And the Buddha said, what if they hit you with their hands? What will you think? And he said, oh, they are very civilized, very civilized, in that they don't hit me with a cloth, a wood. Huh? And the Buddha said, what if they hit you with this wood? And he'll say in reply, oh, the Sunan Paranta people are very civilized, then that they don't hit me with a stick. And then the Buddha said, what if they hit you with a stick? 
And he still said, oh, the Sunaparanta people are civilized in that they don't hit me with a knife. So you look at the attitude the venerable Puna had. Amazing. And what if they hit you with a knife, the Buddha said. And even then, he said, they're very civilized in that they don't take my life with a sharp knife. The Buddha then, of course, praised the venerable Puna and said, you have the right attitude to be a teacher. So the Venerable Puna, in short, did go to Sunna Paranta. He taught very successfully, and then he died there. And the people from Sunna Paranta actually came to inform the Buddha of this. And the Buddha told them that the Venerable Puna was an Arahant. So what the lesson we learn here is first, learn the Dhamma, utilize it, have a change in our attitude, and then, of course, live it in our everyday life using that shift. And I call it a seismic shift in attitude, literally an earthquake. And the beauty of the Buddha's teachings is how they always return our attention to your own mind. Everything you feel and do is driven by our mind. This means you can follow the path of awakening, no matter what anyone else around you is doing. Our awakening and growth is not contingent on others because your refuge is not external. Your refuge is in the wisdom of the Buddha Dhamma. Remember I said earlier, for other people of other faiths, their refuge is in power. The power of whoever their God is and their faith that he will use that power to bail them out. But your refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha is not in an external power. Your refuge in the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha is in the wisdom of the Buddha, Dharma, which is within you. That is your refuge. What to do? how to do, when to do, and what state of mind. So search inside ourselves for happiness using the Dhamma as your guide. And I like this meme made by brother Dr. Henry. What you're looking for is already inside you, like this man looking for food in the fridge. The food is already inside him. Search inside yourself. You have a precious jewel inside yourself. This go Buddha, this go image of the Buddha is inside your mind. And that is why it is so precious. Also realize that karma lies solely in our own hands. If I own the problem, I also own the solution. All right. And as we grow older, many things will leave us. We will utilize our money, our hair is gone, we cannot sleep, etc., etc. And you think you're all alone. But don't worry. Actually, you're not all alone. Something is always with you, your karma. What you have done, which is good, wholesome, is always with you. Similarly, what is unwholesome and not too good. Now, first, I repeat, no one is inadequate. Each of us has the Buddha nature within. Second, we always have a choice. That choice is up to us. You must have the eight factor of the path, right stillness, right calmness, so that you have that time in a split second to make a mindful decision. That calmness, even if it is for a few seconds, is enough for you to reflect, not to let an emotion overrule your mind and take over your body. Be awake to reality. And the reality is the impermanence, the dissatisfaction, the non-self nature, the interconnected of all things. And this, I repeat, is in the first noble truth, the very first thing the Buddha taught us. This is the common denominator of human life. 
What is dukkha? Birth, aging, decay, death. We are familiar with it. But remember, association with the unpleasant, be it an unpleasant co-worker, a boss, etc., customer, separation from those you like, not to get what you want. This is what every one of us face, whether at work or at home or at hobby or even going to a restaurant. The Buddha told us this is the very first noble truth of life. Get real. Realize this. Now adapt to make the best out of it. And what is the second noble truth? We all know it is the noble truth of the cause of our dukkha. And you know, it is from tanha, craving, craving for kamma, kamma tanha, for K-A-M-A, -A, one M, sensual. K-A-M-M-A -A and K-A-M-A -A are completely two different words. K-A-M-A -A is sensual objects, pleasures. That's why just now brother Danny chanted, Kame sumi chachara, one M, the abuse of sensual pleasures. So one of our causes, our craving for sensual pleasures. And you say, oh, bawa tanha, often interpreted as lifetimes, but no, bawa tanha is our craving for becoming. That means you've got something good now. You don't want to let it go. You want it to have more and more and more and more. You want it to continue to become like that. You're going to be very disappointed because nothing is permanent. And similarly with Bawa Tanha, we don't want it. That means you have experienced something bad like the heat. And we say, no, 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 I don't want the heat. I want an aircon room. If you have the choice of an aircon room, fine. If you do not have the choice you need not be unhappy. So the three things, craving for sensual pleasure, craving for continuation of becoming, and craving for discontinuation of disbecoming. Now in Japan, many of you are familiar with this, that when a cup or a pot is broken, they don't throw it away. They send it to an artisan who lovingly glue it back together and use gold dust or lacquer, if you are rich, gold dust, if you are not so rich, lacquer, to actually cover up all the cracks so that the cracks are now an object of beauty. Even within imperfection, which is almost all the time, you can have happiness. And Ajahn Chah's teaching of him using a cup and people asking him, you know, this world is so impermanent. How can you protect your loved ones harm from harm, illness, and death? And Ajahn Chah held out a cup and said, someone gave me this cup. Beautiful. Beautiful cup. One day it will break on my table, shelf, whatever. But I know that this glass is already broken. So I make full use of it now. I enjoy it incredibly. And one of the Buddha's profound teaching to us is Anicca Dukkha Anatta. This cup is already broken. Realize that it's a fact of life, a universal characteristic. So when it breaks, do not moan, but be grateful that it has served you well. Similar with all the other things in life which are impermanent. So our perception is very important. And I thank again, Brother Dr. Henry, for making this meme for me. To a lover, a beautiful woman is a delight. To a monk, a distraction. To a mosquito, a good meal. It's the same person, but three completely different perceptions. So we can change our perception and amidst what is so-called impermanent, dukkha, unhappy, we can progressively, day by day, live happier because we know these realities. We adapt and we no longer hold on to it, crave for it, or demand that it be changed before we are happy. 
So our daily life must and can become our spiritual practice. And Buddhist spiritual practice comes down basically to effort and mindfulness. So our spheres of life, be it working at home, pursuing a hobby, it's all spiritual practice. I now share another Chan story, which I love very much. I call it walking to the toilet. And here you have a man who approached a Chan master and asked the Chan master, oh, great master, what is the highest realization in Chan? The master looked at him with compassion and said, Oh, please wait a moment. I need to go to the toilet and pee. And so he walked away. And as he walked away, he suddenly stopped, turned around and looked at the person and said, something so simple as going to the toilet to pee. Can you do it for me? Well, obviously the answer is no. And so he said, even something so mundane, can you do it for me? You can't. Only you can see the truth for yourself. He cannot tell it to you. Just like I share every Friday night, or with some off days, of course, for the last half year. It's a message which has been put into many aspects, and everyone has listened. But unless you see it for yourself, it will not have much of an impact. And I love this Chan story because it is so true. Every one of us here had learned, but we are not washing our bowl. Every one of us is still looking for someone to pee on our behalf, which is impossible. So right livelihood, Within the Buddha Dharma is part of spiritual life. Are you aware that among the various spiritual traditions in the Buddha Dharma, right livelihood is right smack in the Eightfold Path? So simply put, that means our work must be helping and it must not be harming any living beings. Are you aware that the five precepts that Brother Danny Teo just chanted, they prevent us from harming other people. They are guidelines to make sure that you walk within these confines. Do not harm other people. Out of the five precepts, are you aware that the only precept that is theoretically for you Strictly for you is the fifth precept because that precept demands that you have a clear mind. If you do not have a clear mind, all the other four precepts are meaningless. The other four precepts serve to protect your friend, your family, your wife, your husband, etc. Now, you can even be a garbage collector and in the spirit of metta, karuna, be well on the way to awakening. Be well on the way to be a very good person. There is no question that garbage collecting is right livelihood. While a greedy and high paying position in a corrupt and greedy field, which I will not name, is not right profession. Now, walking the path may ultimately lead us to change careers, but sometimes our personal and family commitments may not allow an immediate change. However, in the end, only a career that will help us develop spiritually will make us truly fulfilled. So I'm so happy that Brother Danny just now also looked at the five aspects of the five precepts from a positive way. And this is another way of looking at the five precepts. The first, I embrace the teaching of loving kindness. That's why I do not wish to harm, etc., etc. All right? So what are your wants? If your wants is like in this background, which a sister made for me, 
then there will be no end. And you will never be happy. The art of being happy is to be satisfied with what you have and do not have. Very often you hear people tell you the art of being happy is to be satisfied with what you have. I want to add another line, which is more important. I think the art of being happy is to be satisfied with what you do not have. That is even more important. Now we live in an environment, a world of instant noodle, instant coffee, instant success. And nowadays people have very little patience. They want instant success in everything. Even our dear little Snoopy here is impatient. But calmness and stillness is something the Buddha said is very important for us to have success. If not, you will make wrong decisions. So while Kopio, without sugar, from television, from Kwang, supplied by brother Juicing to me, keeps me awake physically, and I'm very grateful to him. He never accept back money from me. Whenever he buys this, I've already given up already. But I have to be grateful for him giving me this because every time I have to teach a class, I will take a cup of coffee to make sure I don't become comatose because of my students. But it is not coffee, brothers and sisters, which keeps us awake spiritually. It is the Dhamma which keeps us awake spiritually and i hope we always use this now i like icons those of you who have been to my house will see i have icons everywhere because icons are important to remind us of our commitments and here is a factory in uk a storehouse sorry not a factory a storehouse in uk and right in the midst of this storehouse the developer of this storehouse has built a Buddhist stupa to remind everyone of the qualities that he and hopefully the company hold dear. If every one of us can do this for our environment, we would have added a little extra to remind ourselves constantly of the Buddha Dharma. <coughs> Excuse me. Brother Wei Li, Brother Mui Han loves photography. I wonder how many of us among here, 281, are aware that the Canon camera that you use, such a popular camera before the handphone came, but still a very popular camera nowadays, made in Japan. How many of you are aware that the original name is Kwan Non, the goddess or the bodhisattva of compassion. And in fact, this is the first Canon camera. If you look at the logo, you will see Kwan Non, the bodhisattva of compassion. And how many of you are aware that the lens, the very first lens in the Canon camera it's called the Kashapa lens after Maha Kashapa. And that is because the developer was a Buddhist. What do you use a camera for? To take sharp, accurate pictures without distortion, with correct vision. And his vision is the Buddha Dharma will give you that correct vision without distortion, without prejudice. And so when he made this camera, he named it Kwanon with a Kashapa lens. As the camera became so popular and internationalized, they realized the poor people in the West could not pronounce this word. And so it became Canon, a word which is now universally familiar to all of us. So this is a wonderful icon. Every time you guys take the camera, be it whatever brand, realize it is giving you correct vision, sharp vision, and that is what the Dhamma is trying to do. Now, a Chan student was walking with his 
master when it started to rain. And then the students started running from the rain when the master said, you do not need to run. The rain is everywhere. And again, I love this beautiful story. Everywhere around us, you will have dukkha. There is no place you can run to that does not have it. But everywhere you can utilize the Dhamma. Everywhere you can use the Dhamma as your umbrella, as your refuge. There is no escape with mundane or sensual gratification. It is only temporary. Now, non-self is a very important application. We are all familiar with this sort of cloth. It's called muslin cloth. The holes are big. You can almost see through. And if the wind blows, the wind will go through it. Now, if you realize that you and me, there is no concrete, no permanent self. We are just energies. That you and me is like this muslin cloth. People who insult us, scold us, call us bad names, say bad things about it. As long as you don't block it, you let it flow past you like a muslin cloth allowing wind and air to pass through. Nothing happens. It's only when you have an ego as big as a mountain, as solid as a rock, and that's where you will get hurt. The Buddha had taught non-self as one of the fundamental teachings. And also, please do take care of each other, your Kayana meters, everyone, because we are all interconnected. What you lose as you walk this path is your greed, your hatred, and your ignorance. Finally, when you lose all your greed, all your hatred, and all your ignorance. That is the third noble truth. And what is left when you have lost your greed, your hatred, your ignorance? What remains is metta, karuna, mudita, upeka, and nibbana. Our development, our improvement, while on a mundane materialistic level, is important for us to earn a living. A long-lasting happiness must develop on a mental level. So you need to develop both your career, materially, physically, and very important, mentally. I hope none of us will live to say this, that youth is a folly, adulthood, a struggle, and old age, a regret. I hope none of us in this group of 295 people will live to say these three words, these three lines, which is very sad. Now, all the strategies that I mentioned are open secrets. I myself have said this so many times, and any book you pick up on the Buddha Dharma will also have it. But whether we have actually learned it, seen it with insight and applied it, is entirely up to each individual here. With that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. And I now pass the stage back to Brother Danny. Sad, sad. Thank you, Brother Punyo. What a wonderful Dharma sharing. So now we come to the Q&A session. Uh, so please do take this opportunity to ask questions. You may type your question in the FB, the Facebook. And for information, the Puna Wong is the author of this book itself. And you, if you read this book, please take this opportunity to clear your doubts. Okay. Dr. Puna, we have one question here. It's from uh, Brother Leong Yu Meng, SJBA. His question is, how can one lay person not give in to the emotional mind? 
Even a loving mother will give in to a crying and emotional baby. Brother Yuming, I think you have slightly misunderstood. I say, do not allow the emotional mind to dominate you so that you make wrong decisions. For example, when you walk into a mall, you will see very wonderful and beautiful window dressings. Those are meant to attract your attention and stimulate your emotional mind. And that's why you will see somebody like James Bond wearing a very expensive watch. And then it is meant to make you think that if you also own a watch and wear a watch like this, you will look like James Bond. I can assure you that no matter what watch I wear, I am not going to look like James Bond. But that's how advertisement works. People will buy that because they imagine they will look like James Bond. So that is what I mean when I say that your emotional mind has taken over your logical mind and you are making a decision which is irrational. On the other hand, if you go to Sitya Inn in Malacca and you see these homeless people, lost jobs, etc., queuing up and getting that free food package which they arrange to dana out, you may be filled with compassion and you say, oh, I must do something to help. Now, that is wholesome emotion. Not all emotions are bad. What I do not want you to do is to see that three-quarter naked girl holding that engine oil and saying, buy this engine oil and your car will be as smooth as my skin. Good heavens, what has a half-naked girl got to do with engine oil? Absolutely nothing beyond stimulating our emotional mind and trying to make us associate this brand with this engine oil. You can see how ridiculous it is when you actually reflect. Why is it you never have an old man holding a can of engine oil selling? Because no one is interested. So this is what I'm trying to say. You have got three minds, a brainstem, an emotional mind, and finally your logical mind or your neocortex. For most people who are untrained, decisions are very, very dominated by emotional minds. If you look back at your own life, you will find so many of your decisions are made because of emotions, not because of logic. Here we are asking you, review that emotional mind and see, is it worth, correct, logical to act in such a way? This is what meditation trains you. Samatha meditation trains you to calm that emotional mind so that the emotional mind does not dominate your thinking process. Vipassana meditation trains your intellectual mind to look objectively and come to a decision. That's why you need both. You need both Samatha and Vipassana for you to come to rational decisions because you must not allow our emotional mind, which has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years, and a lot of it is based on greed and on anger and on ignorance. You imagine if you see something that made you angry, your emotional mind will dominate you. That's why you always ask, come to 10, take 10 deep breaths, etc. Basically, they're trying to teach you some matta application, calm yourself down and let your logical mind make a decision. I hope that is clear now. All right. Thank you, Brother Danny. Yeah, we have another question from uh, Chia Manfong, BGM. My job requires me to kill harmful insects and summon people. Am I creating bad karma? Please guide me. Summon as in summon, summon, uh, Malay summon. Uh, okay. Now, congratulations, Brother Chia Man Fung. I imagine you are a brother. I congratulate you. You are creating very good karma. You are not creating bad karma. If you are creating bad karma, then there is no hope for me. Because in my 35 years as a doctor, I have killed billions of germs. I don't know how many parasites, countless. Because the point, the point 
Brother Chia Man Fong, is not to be attached to concepts cast in stone. The point is to use your wisdom. I have killed billions of bacteria in my life. People see me with all kinds of infections, we treat. We are killing beings which are breeding. Okay. Similarly, a question often is raised to me. Oh, during dengue season, should we go around fogging? I say, of course, unless you're an idiot, you will obviously go around fogging. The reason is, what are you trying to achieve? You are trying to save human lives from dying, from dengue, from malaria, in my case, from pneumonia, from sepsis. That is what we are trying to do. We are trying to save Brother Danny. And if there's an outbreak in Brother Danny's district in Malacca, I would say you'll be a very unwise person if you do not fork, because you're trying to save Brother Danny. You're not trying to kill Brother Danny. In fact, if you say, oh, I'm a very good Buddhist, you know, I do nothing, I just sit there. Then I say, not only are you incompetent, you're quite stupid, because now Brother Danny may die as a result of your incompetence. So we always have to ask ourselves, remember, what is karma? Chetana is karma. Intention is karma. In every act that creates karma, what is the intention behind that act? That is the question you have to ask. If your intention is because uh, you love to go and whack the grasshopper, uh, you know, when we were children, we are so cruel. I still remember in primary school, we had this patch of grass behind our classroom. And during interval, boys being boys so naughty, we were going to catch the grasshopper. And then we do terrible things to the grasshopper, pull one leg out, pull this out. I'm sure every one of you did that. All right, those were bad, innocent days. So that's bad because the intention is purely for your own sadistic enjoyment and torturing that poor grasshopper. But here your intention in fogging is not that. Your intention is to save Brother Danny Kyo's life. It's like me saying, Brother Chaman Fung, why do you boil water before you drink it? If you are so attached to the words, then don't boil the water. The reason being, within that water is a lot of life. That's why the Jains go around with a broom sweeping the floor before they even walk. And they wear a mask because they say, even I breathe, I might breathe in something. And they can't cook their food. They have to eat it raw. They have to eat the vegetables without cooking this, boiling that, adding this, adding that. Because to them, the more you do, the more killing. So why are you cooking your vegetables, Brother Chia? Why are you boiling your water? This is what I'm trying to say. What is your intention? And your saman. Now, if the guy breaks the law, he parks double park in Kuala Lumpur, even triple park, by all means, summon him. Because you are doing your duty. He is very, very bad in his action by making convenience to himself and inconvenience to the rest of society. Your duty is to try and stop this. And so if you summon him, I again say congratulations. You're doing very good karma because your intention is for society to run smoothly. All right? If not, if everybody does what he wants, you can imagine the harmonious living that Buddhists pursue with the Eightfold Path, with our precepts, will go down the drain. Thank you. Okay, we have a third question from uh, Janet Ang Kinada, uh, but it sounds a bit. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a question or not. Thank you, brother. I know this is Dukkha. May I ask how to transcend the chores that you don't like doing or how to change the thinking to like it? Well, this is very difficult for me to answer because I do not know exactly what you mean. I mean, if you say I don't like to cook at home, then, well, okay, la, grab food. La. And how to change your thinking to like it? Well, find someone who can cook very well and maybe you will like how to cook very well. But I'm afraid, Sister Janet, that this is so general that it is very, very difficult for me to actually answer. But generally, taking just as a rough example, 
I assume you mean necessary chores that needs to be done and you find it a chore, literally. So ask husband, buy washing machine, buy dishwashing machine, etc., etc., to try and reduce the chores for you. And how to change the thinking to like it? Well, if you are so heavily burdened by these chores, then of course it is not easy, but if it's cooking, you can always look at it as you're doing something very wholesome for family, for children, that you're cooking food, healthy food for them, et cetera. But um, it's really a very difficult question because it is so far and wide in its scope. I hope I had helped a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, there's uh, one question from uh, Jimmy Wong, EBCM. How do one steer one's spouse who is very emotional to be rational? Well, Brother Jimmy, again, this is a difficult question because you do not know why that person is very emotional. A lot of times, it is a whole lifetime of upbringing all the way from childhood that has made a person what he is and maybe even from the Buddhist viewpoint from past lives. So it is not easy. Now, if the person is emotional and yet functional, that means serving her duty as mother, as spouse very well, then of course we say that that is not pathological. But if one is very emotional, irrational and not functional, then we say, well, that's pathological. And in that context, the person will need professional help. You can try and see there are Buddhist para counselors, there are Buddhist psychiatrists who will try and figure out, rationalize why the person is behaving this way and then trying to offer manners in which the person can have insight into why such behavior is wrong. In other words, this is what we call behavior modification therapy, which is actually very difficult because unless the person has insight that my behavior is destructive, it is going to be very, very difficult to change. Certainly, you're not just going to put three joysticks on an altar, pray, and you expect the person to change. So I repeat, it takes a lifetime of development for us to make what we call our personalities, or maybe even more than one lifetime. And often, childhood traumas, upbringing, education contribute. I repeat again, if the person is very functional, that means despite being emotional, doing the duties of wife, mother, etc., very well, then it is a different story. If the person is very emotional and because of that emotional state becomes destructive in behavior, that is when you need to seek professional help. And nowadays, you're lucky. There are many Buddhist counselors. There are many Buddhist psychiatrists who will be willing to help you and maybe even do um, childhood regression, et cetera, to see whether that can be identified as why the person is like that. Okay. Okay. Next question from Alessandra Chin from BGF. In relationship matters in our daily life, for example, choosing life partner, dealing with parents, children, friends, etc. When the logical mind and emotional mind come into conflict, which mind shall we choose? Alexandra Chin, sister, I hope you realize that when the logical mind and the emotional mind are in conflict, that is what you call dukkha. A lot of our unhappiness and emotional stress arises because our logical mind is in a different direction from our emotional mind. For example, your emotional mind tells you, oh, I want to buy this. And then your logical mind says, no, la, we have got enough money. And then you have this conflict. And then you might do some crazy things to get it. Now, as I say, we are creatures of emotion by evolution. All right? Our limbic system evolved much, much earlier than our neocortex. So by evolution, your emotional mind is much more powerful. That's why all diets will ultimately fail. A doctor can advise Brother Danny to the cows come home. 
about you must eat this, you mustn't eat that, blah, 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 blah because it's good, that is bad, etc., etc. Then he will remember it for one week, two weeks, and then after that, he let. That's it. Why? Because we are telling him to do something against his emotions. The next time he walks past the shop and he sees this wonderful nyonya kueh, which is so fragrant and sweet, which he knows is bad for his diabetes. So for one week, he say tahan. Two weeks, he say tahan. Third week, emotional mind will take over. The emotional mind will say, eh, you must be a fool. After you die tomorrow, there you cannot eat how? Oh, okay, eat. That's why all diets will fail. Because ultimately, there are a few people whose logical mind is so dominant that they say no. No means no. Now, you can put it another way. Now you know why men have affairs. You will wonder why the men must be crazy, isn't it? Good family, good wife, beautiful children, and yet he has affairs outside. And that's because when he sees this beautiful girl whom he had an affair with, his logical mind is suppressed by his emotional mind. He, he doesn't think anymore. His emotional mind is dominant. So given a choice between logical mind and emotional mind is like saying a teenager wanting something. A teenager's emotional mind is very dominant. That's why you will scold people, stop behaving like a child. Grow up for heaven's sake. What do you mean when you say that? When you say that, actually what you mean is, please use your logical mind. Because as you mature, the logical mind becomes more dominant. Of course, in some people, it never becomes dominant. But for most people generally, when you're a teenager, your emotional mind is dominant. And that's why teenagers make bad decisions. All right? Sensual gratification, sugar high, all these are words we associate with teenagers. So Sister Alexander Chin, where there is between logical mind and emotional mind, of course the logical mind is better, especially when the emotional mind is teaching you to do things or pulling you to do things in directions which are unwholesome. As I mentioned earlier, some emotions are actually wholesome. You see people suffering, you want to help. You see someone in pain, you want to relieve. Those, we say, yes, we must do something. But a lot of our emotions, because of our years of evolution, is based on what is in there for me. Read. All right. So one of the lessons I've been taught is always ask yourself, if you can take the I out of this equation, will you still make the same decision? Think about that. I think that's a very useful thing. Okay, if you can remove the I from the equation, that means you've got nothing to gain. Huh? Will you still make that decision? Okay, all right, thank you. We can still take one more question. Anybody else would like to ask questions, please do type your questions in the Facebook comment. Please. Take this opportunity to overcome your hindrance of Vichikicha, Vichikicha Skeptical Doubt. If you have read, read this book, have Skeptical Doubt, please take this opportunity to ask questions. So I'm afraid there more, there, there's no more question. Okay, so if there's no more questions, we shall wrap up our talk tonight.